Father Ann Stetter is a St. Louis native from St. Joseph Parish in Manchester and a graduate of John F. Kennedy High School. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of St. Louis in 2012. Father Ann Stetter served as Associate Pastor of Holy Infant Parish of Baldwin from 2013 to 2015, and he has since served as the Director of Worship here at Kenrick Lennon Seminary. Last year, he earned his doctorate in liturgical theology from the Liturgical Institute in Chicago. We're very blessed to have him here this morning as he shares about St. Joseph and the defeat of discouragement. Please join me in welcoming Father Donald Anstetter. Speaking with a prayer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and loving Father, we gather this morning in the chapel dedicated to St. Joseph, your beloved son, your chosen spouse for your most beloved daughter, Mary, your chosen foster father for Jesus, your most beloved son. We pray that St. Joseph, that great protector and provider, might guard our hearts this morning, might banish from our minds and hearts all fear, worry, and anxiety. May he create a space in us for your spirit that we may be filled with that most precious gift of your love. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome. It's delightful to have you all here to be with you. So this chapel means a lot to me. I have been praying in this chapel for just over 20 years. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes in this chapel. I've seen the redesign, rededication, the new altar, this magnificent baldacchino, new organ. All of these things uh, have happened in this last, these last couple of decades. But some things have remained very much the same. And I've always liked to say this chapel has good bones. It's just a prayerful place. It's substantial. <clears throat> and one of the most important things that has not changed is that it is dedicated to St. Joseph. The St. Joseph Chapel, which I admit is a reality I very often take for granted. I don't even think about it most of the time. Oh, we're meeting in the St. Joseph Chapel. Oh, Mass in the St. Joseph Chapel. I'm praying my holy hour in the St. Joseph Chapel. It's, it's like a worn piece of furniture that sits in the corner. I don't even, don't even think about it. And yet, there's something beautiful about that. The familiarity of this place that even though I take it for granted, has shaped me so deeply. This has been a part of my prayer, even subconsciously, that Joseph has been working on me for a very long time. And though I take him for granted, he has never forgotten me for a moment. That's good news for us. St. Joseph, the patron of the universal church. That means he's the patron for each and every one of us. He has not forgotten any of us for a moment. And so like many of the saints who accompany us, even when we're not aware of it, so many of the saints who choose us, we think it's about us coming up with our favorites, but really it's far more about them choosing us. 
For whatever reason, God has a plan. He's got certain saints that he has in mind for you. And maybe you're aware of them. Maybe you know who they are. Maybe you are very aware of their accompaniment. Or maybe you've yet to discover them. And there's something very exciting about that in the spiritual life. But St. Joseph has very much had his sights set on me. And so I want to just share with you some of the ways that he has been active in my prayer and in my life over the last few years. And in particular, the area where I have found him a most powerful intercessor, a most powerful companion, is when it comes to another spiritual reality that has been a part of my life for a long time, but again, at a subconscious level. And that's the reality of discouragement. Discouragement that I am convinced is just in the air we breathe today. It is pervasive. Our world is a discouraged world. Our country is a discouraged country. Our church is a discouraged church. And by extension, I can guess that for many of us, our families are discouraged families. And I know that very often, my heart is a discouraged heart. But I know with absolute certainty that God does not desire us to wallow in that discouragement. But rather, he has a plan for us. And that plan has one very simple word. It can all be summed up in one simple word. Hope. We have every reason for hope. Regardless of the discouragement of our world, regardless of the anger we see, the sadness, the sense of loss, we have every reason for hope. Jesus is our hope. He has breathed onto us the spirit of hope. And St. Joseph for us is the great defender of hope. The great man of hope. So let's take a little journey with St. Joseph this morning, a journey of hope, a journey that to the eyes of the world looks like a journey of discouragement, but we know is a journey of hope. Because if anyone had reason for discouragement, it's St. Joseph. I'm serious. Think about what he dealt with. Think about the events of his life. Think about finding out that Mary is with child and he has this conviction in his heart that I need to divorce her quietly. The greatest thing that's ever happened to him, he feels the need to walk away from. Or think about having to uproot, take Mary, eight months pregnant, and journey across the country to leave his home and all of the preparations he's been making for the birth of his foster son, the son of God, and journey for this census in Bethlehem to leave what he knows to go to this place that he's only connected with by name because his country's occupied by the Romans. And he has to go register so that he can be taxed. Discouragement. 
And then he gets there and he can't even provide adequate place for Jesus to be born. No place to stay, so he has to go to the stable. No worthy place to lay the Son of God, so he has to use this manger, a feeding trough for animals. Discouragement. And then not long after, in a dream, an angel tells him, Get up. Flee to Egypt. Herod is coming after Jesus. I thought going to Bethlehem was bad enough, but now he has to flee to Egypt so that Jesus is not slain. Think of the fear and anxiety that must have gripped St. Joseph's heart. So much reason for discouragement. And I don't even have my tools with me. How am I going to make a new start when we get there? I don't even know the language. What are we going to do? So Joseph has so much reason for discouragement. But he is not defined by that discouragement. And so I want to take a look at three different places in the life of St. Joseph connected with the sources of discouragement that are turned into great sources of hope. So let's look at Bethlehem, at Egypt, and at Nazareth. So think first of Bethlehem. And in particular, the, there's one object that has captured my attention in prayer, and it's that, that manger. There's just something about me. I have this visceral act, reaction when I put myself in St. Joseph's shoes and think about laying the newborn son of God in a feeding trough. I, I'm revolted. I'm like, how? I, but I have no better place to lay him. I think of St. Joseph when he first receives the angel in the dream who tells him, don't be afraid to take Mary into your home. A son will be born to her. You are to name him Joseph or Jesus. And I think in that moment, all of these great sentiments that would have risen in Joseph's heart, a desire to provide for Mary and Jesus. This resolve to protect Mary and Jesus. I just imagine St. Joseph and his manly heart, I will sacrifice anything for their sake. I will do whatever is needed. But here in this dingy stable, surrounded by animals in this distant village, I just imagine Joseph feeling devastated that he cannot provide better. And then this manger for St. Joseph, in my imagining, and this is, this is me projecting, I don't want to actually say, I think Joseph is a far better man <laughs> than I. But I think about it and I see that manger as a sign of failure. This is the best I could do. But think about what happens. Think about the events of those days of around Christmas, that first Christmas, that Jesus is born. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's lying, laid in that manger. Joseph looks upon the Son of God for the very first time and is filled with wonder. And then something remarkable happens. A group of shepherds arrives, knocks on the door. Talk about smelling like the sheep. And these 
poor shepherds come in and they've heard about Jesus somehow and they want to see him and they recount to Mary and Joseph this incredible story that there they were in the fields and an angel appeared to them and proclaimed to them a message of great joy and they recount to Mary and Joseph what they were told. The angel told us, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The angel is very specific. You will go to Bethlehem. You will find this infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Great. That sounds pretty, pretty typical. But lying in a manger? The angel made sure that that detail was included. And I wonder if that detail was not for St. Joseph. This is the sign that God has chosen. That the promises that the prophets have been making for centuries is coming to fulfillment. A child, the Christ, is born unto you this day in the city of David, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. In that moment, the very sign of failure is transformed. This is not a sign of failure. This is the sign that God is fulfilling his promises for us, for these poor shepherds, for all of humanity. How must that have resonated in the heart of Joseph? And so as I pray with that, as I look at this manger, and I can only think of failure, I had in my head an idea of what success would look like. To be a good father, a good husband, I have to do these things. And I feel that I have failed in that. But now God says, this is the sign. The infant lying in the manger. So that manger could be a source of discouragement. Or it can be a source of hope. And the difference, I think, is our surrender. In this case, I have to surrender my expectations. I have to surrender my criteria for what is success and failure. I have that very clearly mapped out in my mind. What's success? What qualifies as success? What qualifies as failure? I know. And God is asking me to surrender that. He's asking me to trust him. To trust that his criteria for success and failure is better than mine. That's a better way to live. Trusting in the Father. Trusting that he has a clear idea of what is success and failure. So when I look around at our crazy, crazy world, I don't get discouraged because I know God has a different criteria for success. A different idea different expectations. And then I think of Mary next to Joseph. And I think about what her criteria of success and failure is. And I just have to think, for her, what's most important is not the roof over her head. It's St. Joseph next to her. That's the shelter she needs to have Joseph by her side.
So from Bethlehem, let's move on to Egypt. Another dream. Now Jesus and Joseph and Mary have to flee. Have to flee this murderous tyrant, Herod. Again, St. Joseph, I have to just imagine, is fretting about the fact he doesn't even have his tools with him. Left those in Nazareth. Didn't think I was going to have to go start a new life in a different country. But here they go. Plenty of opportunity for discouragement. And here, I just think of the plans that Joseph has to leave behind. Again, he probably had a great idea of how he was going to provide for Jesus and Mary. I've got great plans. I know exactly how I'm going to do this. And I know I can do it well. I'm a good carpenter. But God is asking something very different. Go to this new place. Be surrounded by these new people. And so again, Joseph is being asked to surrender. This time, I think he's being asked to surrender his self-reliance. Control. Mm, I have great plans. I know exactly how this should turn out, how this should go. And God is asking, trust me. Trust my plans. As soon as Joseph and Mary have to flee to Egypt, Joseph's plans are in shambles. How do you even plan? I don't even know where we're going to stay tonight. I don't know where we're going to be. I don't know who we're going to meet. I can't plan. It's a scary place to be. It's a discouraging place to be. But think about, think about this. Think about on the road to Egypt. Just like I love to pray with Jesus asleep in the arms of Joseph. Jesus asleep in the arms of Joseph, without a care in the world. Jesus isn't worried. He's completely confident that his father will take care of him, that Mary will provide for him. Not a care in the world. Think about that 30 years later then, when Jesus is asleep in the boat. And the storm is raging and the apostles are convinced they're going to die. The boat's going to be swamped. We're going to drown. Jesus is asleep in the boat, still content in his Father's arms. That's where Jesus lives always, in the embrace of the Father. But he started that, he learned that, by being held by Joseph. What a peaceful place to be. Jesus knows that. Jesus is not anxious. He is not worried. He's not trying to control. He's completely surrendered to the plan of the Father. And that's where Joseph is learning to live. I think that's where Joseph, I think Mary is teaching Joseph to live in that place as well. Here we are in Egypt. And so just as Jesus allows himself to be cared for by Mary and Joseph, I think we are being invited to the same thing. Will I let myself be cared for like a child? Will I let the Father provide for me, care for me, plan for me, provide for me? Or am I going to continue to try to do all of that for myself? And trust me, I know that's easier said than done. (laughs) 
I enjoy praying with that. And I also, I also like to think of Mary in those moments reminding Joseph of his namesake. Joseph, the patriarch from the book of Genesis, who was sold by his brothers into slavery, sent to Egypt as a slave. And at the very end of that whole story, eventually Joseph works up through the ranks, is favored by Pharaoh, and then his brothers come in need, begging for help. But they're fearful once they find out that this is Joseph. They're afraid that he'll want vengeance and Joseph says to them, Do not fear. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Just imagine Mary reminding Joseph of that story. This terrible thing has happened, the massacre of the innocents, Maybe God has let this happen to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, should be saved. Finally, let's look at Nazareth. After years in Egypt, eventually the Holy Family returns to Nazareth. And for years, Jesus learns to be a carpenter from Joseph. He is obedient to Mary and Joseph. He grows up, grows in strength and wisdom. There's 30 years there, there's many years there, where we just, we don't know what life was like. Jesus lived as any one of us, an unremarkable life. But at some point, Joseph grows old. And as we see depicted just above me, in the baldacchino there, Joseph passes away. And so I think about those last days, those last moments of Joseph's life. And yet another opportunity either for discouragement or hope. Another opportunity for surrender. Joseph has lived a good life. He knows that. But maybe he was thinking back to those promises of the angel. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. He's come to save the world. But if Joseph were like me, maybe he would be a little resentful. Well, I, I don't get to see that. I don't get to see Jesus begin his Ministry, I don't get to see the coming of the kingdom. So I think what Joseph is being asked to surrender here, and what we can learn from, is an invitation to surrender our timeline. I have a great timeline in mind. Just like my plans are really good, Lord. My timeline, it's the best. I know exactly when these things should happen. I know exactly when you should answer my prayers. I know exactly when you should fulfill your promises. <clears throat> but Joseph doesn't cling to that. He doesn't cling to any sort of timeline that he's manufactured. And in these moments, it's enough for him now to be held by Jesus. That's enough. Now I imagine that there must have been many tears shed by Jesus, by Mary, by Joseph. This parting was really hard. Death is awful. It always has been. And Jesus himself, sure. Could he have kept Joseph alive a little longer? Sure. He's God. He can do that. But he doesn't. His promise is even better. In my prayer, I imagine Jesus promising Joseph, I will come for you. I will come for you. 
And I imagine Joseph saying, I know. I look forward to that day. So here is a hope that is not tied by human timelines. It's a hope in Jesus that trusts that he will fulfill his promises beyond any limitations that we see, any limitations that I see. For me, death is a barrier. I can't see beyond it. I don't know how anyone can fulfill a promise beyond death. Jesus can. So hope reaches beyond the grave. Hope has no limits. Hope has no time frame. Jesus promises and he will fulfill it. So you can bet on the day that Jesus is put to death on the cross, when he descends to the dead, when he shatters the gates of hell, who are the first people that he welcomes to heaven? Well, traditionally, we, the, in imagery, we always see it's Adam and Eve first. But I bet Joseph is right there with them. Next in line. What was that reunion like? Jesus greeting his foster father. Welcoming him to heaven. Hope has no limits. And so Joseph teaches us these great lessons. That even though we are surrounded for infinite reasons for discouragement, we have far greater reason for hope. That though our hearts might be darkened by the events of this world, by people that we love the most turning away from us, the faith. Though we might see darkness all around us, we have every reason for hope. And in order to keep that hope alive in our hearts, to fan that flame of hope, we can remove these obstacles through an act of surrender. I surrender my expectations, my criteria for success and failure. Father in heaven, give me your measure of success. Then I can surrender my plans, my control, and my self-reliance. Father, I have a plan. I surrender it to you because I trust that your plan is better. And then I can surrender my timeline. Lord, I know exactly when I think these things should happen. I surrender that to you, trusting that your timeline is better. Trusting that there are no limits on your power and your ability to save. There are no limits on your promise of salvation. Help me to trust. And so I just want to conclude with one of my favorite prayers, the prayer of abandonment. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence. For you are my Father. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.